Confusion about the effectiveness of vaccines is hitting an all-time high. We're going to look into that as well. There are more Delta lockdowns coming. Hello, everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here with another report for you. And uh, this is episode 18. Today, we're going to be talking about the confusion around not just the vaccines and the vaccine narrative that's come out, but the overall narrative of COVID from the start. It's kind of a confusing story. But first, I think there are more Delta lockdowns coming. And uh, we talked about this a while ago. I had an episode titled Delta lockdowns coming weeks and weeks ago. The reason the Delta variant is a pretty badass little variant because of where that mutation happened that created the Delta variant. As we've said, though, I think that it creates a much more transmissive variant, but less lethal. That's what the data says so far. But still, you know what uh, everybody's focusing on at the official policy level, of course, is the number of cases, as they call them. So let's go there now. Let's look into this. And, you know, we're going to use a case example. I, I think sometimes a, a an anecdote helps explain the whole. So sorry, Australia. Today, you're an anecdote. We're going to go there because I think Australia is very instructive. So Let's turn there. So there were these huge protests that erupted all over the world on July 24th. Sydney was one of those places. A number of places in Australia actually saw a pretty, pretty, pretty big protest going on. So here's an example. Um, uh, you can see here, I chose this one. Uh, this comes from um, Mick Sikas at, at AP because it had, you know, there was an ordinary sign in there. It says freedom. And there's a couple of people wearing masks. If you saw a lot of images from this, they were presented as if these people were all declaring that the virus wasn't real. Nobody's really, I mean, hardly anybody. I'm sure some people are, but not the, the virus is very real. Let me start there. It's a very real virus. I know people have been impacted by it. I don't personally worry about it that much because I have a very strongly prepared terrain. Get to that in a minute. If you haven't been watching me, uh, you might not know what that means. But for those of you who have, There's a way that you can be relatively uh, inoculated from this virus. And of course, being young helps, being healthy helps, those sorts of things. Some of those things you can't really do much about. So some of them you can. At any rate, here are the big protests that were happening on July 24th. But let's look into, let's set some context. This is usually what's missing in all the articles you read. A little context. So Australia, what do we know? In 2019, at 25.36 million people, presumably has some more. Put that in context. Uh, that places it with a lower population than Canada or California. But still, in a sample size of 25 million people, now probably at least 26, 27, you would have a pretty good sample size to know what's going on. Secondarily, this is what is really driving the narrative in Australia right now is a rise in cases But let me be clear, these aren't really cases. Remember, a case is somebody who's both infected and is showing up at the hospital or their doctor for medical attention. These are infected people, I think. And as well, it's not a good measure of infected people either, because if you really wanted that, you'd go out and you'd do a rolling sample, a random sample from people out just out in the street. Neither of those happen. I can't totally tell you, you know, a lot of people show up and get tested because they're having symptoms. Some people get tested because they were in proximity or live in a household with people who got symptoms, but they're asymptomatic. At any rate, this is what's driving the narrative right now in Australia. 187 cases per day out of 26 plus million people. This is what's what's driving the story. Uh, And as well, if we said, well, what's the impact of this? The three day moving average of deaths, new deaths in Australia due to COVID is one. So we're talking about one person who's dying out of 26 million, and this is driving the narrative. Now, I, I totally get it. The health authorities, there, health authorities there are worried about the idea that if this gets away, if this becomes uncontained, off it runs, and suddenly these numbers really explode. But even at the peak of everything that was going on, get my drawing tool out here, in Australia, we were still back here at 25. So like a one in one million chance of dying on any given day from COVID um, back there at the peak of everything, which was uh, August, September, uh, which would have been their spring, of course, down there. And as well, a little more context, how many people are actually sick? This is data as of uh, July 30th, that's today. Uh, they have 3,000 people um, who are in mild conditions, so that's 98% of the sample size, and 2% of the sample size is in serious or critical condition. So there's 59 people in the country 
who are in serious or critical condition. And um, again, as we talked about in a couple of recent episodes, particularly one we just did that was on um, who is dying from COVID. The CDC data was very clear about this. We connected two pieces of data. First, uh, age. Age is the most important determinant. As you can see here, the older you are, the better the chance you have of dying from COVID. This is a death rate by age. So I'm going to guess that at least some, statistically speaking, some of these serious or critical people here are probably older and as well, comorbidities. So these are the comorbidities that most highly correlated in the CDC data set for being bad ones that would uh, indicate that you had a higher chance of progressing to a serious or critical or even death sort of a case. Now, an alert uh, member at Peak Prosperity pointed out to me that I left off a couple of the most important um, comorbidities, as it were, conditions that might lead to a higher uh, disease state. One of them is for people who actually have what they call the Neanderthal gene, right? So people who have a, a stronger lineage with that you can trace back to some genetic stock with Neanderthals in sharing that in common with those distant ancestors, their actual uh, death statistic, instead of being 1.30, as we see for obesity, which indicates a 30% higher chance of dying given that comorbidity, that the Neanderthal gene might get you as high as 1.6. So like very much at the top of this list. So genetics can play a, a role in this as well. That wasn't uh, teased out in the CDC data. And of course, the number one thing that happens that's really bad is no treatments for you. Just go home, come back if your lips are blue, maybe take some aspirin. That sort of medical nihilism is, is really responsible for much more damage than even these things right here. But at any rate, point I'm trying to make here is that this isn't saying that all of Australia is at great risk because maybe Delta is going to explode through. Let's be very clear. The risk is stratified by both age and the general uh, how well you are or unwell you are, depending on which way you want to look at this. So uh, a bit of orientation. Um, New South Wales, uh, it's this big territory right here. Uh, it's got Queensland to the north, Victoria to the south, or um, uh, yeah, I guess I got that right because we're south of the equator, I had to think for a second. Uh, Sydney, Sydney's in there. And so that, that big protest I showed you came from Sydney. Now, let's turn to the health minister of NSW here and uh, listen in to the advice that uh, people are getting. So this camp comes on July 20th. I think this got recorded on July 19th. So this is before the protest. Given one average daily death. This is the advice that people are being asked to live with and under. It isn't human nature to engage in conversation with others, to be friendly. Um, unfortunately, this is not the time to do that. So even if you run into your next door neighbour in the shopping centre, in the Coles, while you're at Coles and Woolworths or Aldi or any other um, grocery shop, don't start up a conversation. Now is the time for minimising your interactions with others. Even if you've got a mask, do not think that affords total protection. We want to be absolutely sure that as we go about our daily lives, we do not come into contact with anyone else that would pose a risk. We don't want to come in contact with anyone else who might pose a risk. I think that sign language interpreter... Uh, they, they could have just shortchanged the whole thing and just had her just wag her finger at people. Um, this is uh, just unbelievable. The, the idea that, that they, they want you not to hug people, not to even talk to people. The messaging here is that other people are dangerous and they're a risk. Now, if you've been watching my program, you understand that might be true. It's more true if you're older and unwell. And it's less true if you're younger and healthy. Right. That's part one. Part two is we have no examples really of uh, yet of outdoor transmission being a serious thing, but maybe with Delta variant, it could be. But even with that, we could add a little more subtlety and say, oh, for those of you who have already had COVID, we know that you have the best immunity, which is natural immunity. It, there's just no subtlety to this. It's just you have to treat every other human as a giant risk. Right. And so here we are 18 months or 19 months now into this pandemic. And this is still the level of unsophisticated advice that's coming out. It's very fear-based. It's really not, um, 
it's something that people are reacting to pretty badly. Not badly, I think maybe reacting even appropriately. So let's go here. Uh, this is July 24th, and thousands of people are protesting the coronavirus lockdowns in Australia. Look at this. Just the protest comes as uh, co- protest comes as COVID-19 case numbers in the state reached another record with 163 new infections in the past 24 hours. Greater Sydney has been locked down for the past four weeks, with residents only able to leave home with a reasonable excuse. Um, So, well then, can we say the lockdowns aren't working? I mean, we're seeing the spikes in infections, but people have been locked down in the past four weeks. Um, And so... This is just, it's people are ready to get back on with their lives. And by the way, I would support that idea because uh, this is now a virus that we're going to have to live with. And part of living with a virus is you accept that some people are going to get it. Part of that story is you accept that some people, maybe those with Neanderthal genes, maybe people who are older, who are sicker, who have some other underlying thing we don't know about yet. Some people are going to get hit worse than others. You do your best to manage that. That's what we should be doing. We should be doing our best to manage that uh, as we go forward. So... What's interesting, though, is the loss of freedom. So if we look back at that original protest going on up here, that's really the central sign. That's why I picked this image, because I think a lot of people are saying, you know what? We want our freedom. We want our freedom. We understand, you know, going swimming in the ocean is risky, but we don't have health ministers saying we can't have anybody swimming in the ocean because last year somebody died from this or there was a shark out there or whatever the story is. People want their freedom. And by the way, Uh, part of life is sometimes it's got some risks and people do things that are risky. They ride mountain bikes, they ski really fast, they go parasailing, they go scuba diving. And those things are thrilling and exciting and fun in part sometimes because they have a little risk associated with them. All right. I don't want to minimize this, but I think we're just, this is just, we're, this is, we're past, we're not being clever at all. This is about something else. It's not about public health. Because again, if it was about public health, that health minister would have gone out of her way to say, and by the way, People really should be controlling their weight. They really ought to be working on reducing these metabolic disorders, which lead to a lot of these comorbidities. And people should be exercising, and they should get plenty of vitamin D. And maybe, just maybe, there's a couple of other uh, supplements out there that could also help improve somebody's underlying terrain of their body so that if they do get exposed, they have a much lighter, hopefully asymptomatic run with COVID, run in with COVID, which would then lead to natural immunity, which is... That's right. The best kind. All right. Uh, Quote here. They say uh, we live in a democracy. And normally I certainly am not one. I I am certainly one who supports people's right to protest. But (laughs) rule of life, whenever there's a but, you can ignore everything that came before it. Um, But at the present time, we've got cases going through the roof and we have people thinking that's okay. uh, to get out there and possibly uh, be close to each other. At a demonstration. Um, Brad Hazard, great name for a health minister, um, given the context of this whole thing. So at any rate, it's like I, I, we live in a democracy. And normally, I would I would support uh, people's right to protest. But <laughs> ignore all of that <laughs> at the present time. We have cases going through. So all of a sudden, uh, what's being normalized here is the idea that a health emergency is really the most important thing that could override every other consideration in life. It, it's it's literally, that's what you're saying, you know, I understand people have these other quaint ideas of rights and freedom and stuff, but we have a health emergency. And to which I would say, if you could please point to the health emergency on this chart, I would love to see it. Um, because by the way, if you plotted car accident deaths or people dying from heart attacks, which were in some measure maybe avoidable because of better dietary or exercise habits or other lifestyle choices. If I, I, I don't see the emergency here at this point in time. I'm open to the idea that there could be one if things really got out of control. But again, we could be smarter about this all. So we're going to get into that um, real quick and what that all means. So this was interesting. Um, this is uh, actually shot from that day of protest. I believe this is shot in Sydney. That's how it was marked. Um, but I'm, I don't know. Uh, Australia well enough to say if that's true. Maybe some of you could help me out. But let's go in here for a minute. We can just sort of get the general vibe. Um, People are clearly fairly unhappy with the whole thing. Uh, The police are pretty much walking around. I don't see anybody really feeling like they're in much danger. Police are turning their backs on people. 
Uh, there's de you know, some pushing and shoving. Little of that going on, uh, for sure. Um, I'm not clear why the police are trying to keep people from what. I don't know where they're going. But generally speaking, the tone here is you can feel that people are pretty well fed up. And they're ready for a change in circumstances. And they would like to have their freedom back, I guess. So what's interesting here uh, that's coming up is that the people of Australia have chosen a chant uh, that has come up multiple times. And we'll be able to hear it here in just a second. So... That policeman's clearly got splashed with something. I don't know, ink. You serve us. You serve us. That's that's the that's the point there. But if you watch my rats in a cage video, I think the police and these people they're all on the same side. Um, maybe don't know it yet. So um, the police, I think, are tasked with a very difficult job at this point in time, which is. Uh, uh, trying to get people who are really fed up with their lives being so severely interrupted, uh, being put on with, with more um, nonsensical things. This is really nonsense to say you should be so afraid and treat everybody as a viral disease vector who might come up and just kill you. You shouldn't even talk to them, you know, let alone, you shouldn't hug them, all that stuff. So, so this is really, it's hard to square up that particular piece of advice with anything we know about how this disease goes yet and, and who is really at risk from it. A more nuanced version, I think, is certainly possible by this stage of the whole thing and um, where we could clearly say, if you are of a certain age, if you have certain comorbidities, you should be, have higher levels of caution and concern. But if you are already exposed and have natural immunity or you're young or you're this or you're that, Maybe you don't have anything to be worried about or fear at that at that particular point in time. Well, I think if Australia just jumped the shark, uh, this just came out uh, this morning just as I was getting ready to put this all together. I had to put this one in here. July 30th, Australian troops will help enforce a coronavirus lockdown in Sydney. So the people said, hey, we're tired of this. The health minister is like, well, we don't even want you talking to each other. People come out and say, well, you serve us. And the response is, well, let's bring the troops in because, of course, it's it's just that much of a serious health emergency. Got to bring the troops in, uh, clearly. So that's that's been the decision there. You can see the stuff going. Um, well, what is the story? What, what is the story? Let's rewind a little bit. You remember the story? Uh, when I first put out my first video on, on January 23rd, 2020, for the next two weeks, I was battling this headline. It's just the flu. Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they were all like running these articles like saying, oh, it's just the flu, right? And they were getting bad information from the WHO, which was busy downplaying the whole thing. And then you remember uh, after they were done with the it's just the flu phase, they said, oh, OK, all right, all right it, it might be more than the flu, but it's not a pandemic, right? So and I was calling it a pandemic because I used, uh, well, that's right, the WHO's own pandemic guideline checklist. Remember, ding, ding, ding. It like clearly was a pandemic. And, and then and then so that story fell apart. And so then they said, well, yeah, it's a pandemic, but it's certainly not worth shutting down flights from Wuhan over. That would be racist, right? That was that was the logic. And, and I was just talking with epidemiologists and, and people who could like, you know, just do basic understanding, logic, reason. Of course you shut down the flights from Wuhan. Of course, you shut down flights from everywhere. Uh, we didn't do that. So so uh, the world didn't do that for a long time. So after you made it through that little nightmare, which I think brings us to about the end of February, then the story shifted again. I was like, hey, uh, masks aren't necessary. Uh, they really don't work. We had the director of the CDC. We had Anthony Fauci. We had all these officials. We had the Surgeon General of the U.S. saying, yeah, you know, masks, they don't, studies show they don't, they don't really work. Uh, they don't really work. And, and then we went from there to, um, uh, oh, Oh, you know what the goal is? We got to flatten the curve. I was a big proponent of flatten the curve because flatten the curve makes a lot of sense. Because the goal really should have been just don't overwhelm your your hospitals and don't overwhelm your health services. Just make sure that your your hospitals don't get crushed with too many patients where they have to triage and that leads to very bad outcomes, not just for COVID patients, but for motorcycle accidents victims and things like that. So that was the story for a long time. We need to flatten the curve. I'm just wondering if we think back, like, that was the story. Now what's the story? Well, the curve is completely crushed here. It's completely flattened, right? This is a flat curve. 59 people in a nation of 26 million in serious or critical condition. That's a pretty flat curve right there. So 
now we got to ask what the overall what what's the goal? What 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 is the what what is what is the goal here? So that's a good question. I think that's what these freedom protests are about. I think that's why we're seeing the social unrest because people are starting to ask that question and say what what well, what is even happening here? So and then though, if you remember, we went from uh, we need to flatten the curve. All of a sudden, the whole narrative shifted, and um, these very lucrative vaccines came out. And all of a sudden, the the, the story became, oh, vaccines are going to help us achieve herd immunity. And we had all these talks, and we need to get to eighty percent of people with serological or antibody um, titers above a certain level. And then we'll have this magic herd immunity thing, right? And remember Fauci, Anthony Fauci in the U.S. was like, well, we need to hit 70 percent, 75, 80. Do I hear 85? We don't know. But we're, you know, that was the whole story was that we needed to hit some level of people who are immunologically competent so we could achieve herd immunity, right? And then if you remember, because many of you saw this, do you remember the whole definition of herd immunity then changed like, whoops, you know? From June of 2020, this is 9th of June of 2020, remember the WHO had the correct definition of herd immunity, which, which as of June 2020 was herd immunity is the indirect protection from an infectious disease, indirect, meaning I'm not immunologically competent because I haven't been exposed to the, to the disease vector yet, but everybody around me has, they are fire breaks. So indirectly, if the virus tries to come through those people to me, it can't get to me because it hits the fire break. So that's why they call it indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens here. Look, when a population is immune, either through vaccination or immunity developed through previous infection, because that's natural immunity, best kind of immunity. And then mysteriously on the 13th of November, 2020, all of a sudden, the WHO says herd immunity, also known as population immunity, is a concept used for vaccination in which a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of vaccination is reached. Herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from a virus, not by exposing them to it. They just, the WHO just silently and without any scientific fanfare, completely changed the definition of herd immunity, which, by the way, had been in place for a long time, all of history until oh, November. And then all of a sudden it changed. And so now it's all about the vaccine. So uh, if that's the case, you'd better be bringing out a vaccine that's caught a sterilizing capability to it. And of course, we didn't do that. We just brought a vaccine out. So now all of a sudden, follow along. Uh, it went from vaccines will help us achieve herd immunity to vaccines are the only way to achieve herd immunity, which is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Uh, in case I need to repeat that. So the WHO, I don't know. It's just complete junk. I don't know what the WHO was up to, but they were busy saying at the beginning, we don't need to stop flights from Wuhan. And I was over here going, what? And then they're saying vaccines are the only way to achieve herd immunity. I'm like, what? I really don't track with the WHO. Somebody's got to help me understand that organization a little better. So at any rate, uh, and then the story because we now know the vaccines are the only way to achieve herd immunity, that was in November of 2020, rapidly turned into this, which is uh, unvaccinated Americans are putting communities at risk. This is Biden. This is very recently. This is just July 7th. This is the president of the United States saying the unvaccinated now are putting communities at risk. So this is individuals. An unvaccinated American would be an individual they're putting communities at risk. So the individuals putting the community or the collective at a risk. So you can see the framing there is really important. The individual is now putting everybody at risk. Um, and again, no subtlety here. It's not putting immunologically naive people at risk or putting the older people at risk or older people with comorbidities. It's putting communities. And who lives in a community? Everybody. Old people, young people. <laughs> it's like... They're putting everybody at risk. So that's the story, and that's coming out. Now, Now that's cool, I guess, if you've got a sterilizing vaccine that's wicked effective. If you don't, this story could fall apart on you at great risk. Because remember the damage that happened as we went from the CDC and Fauci saying, no masks. Oh, masks. Wait, double masks. I mean, the story just changed so many times. You don't get too many shots at that at the national sort of public health level. You really got to be, remember, my whole advice the whole time has been clear, consistent, scientifically valid conclusions 
only, and then let people know when you're guessing a little bit, and then let them know when you're guessing a lot. Just and let people sort that out for themselves, right? But nope, they're coming out with these pronouncements. This is the president of the United States saying that unvaccinated Americans put communities at risk. Okay, let's track along here. Uh, and then this from Fauci, which is again, July 16th. That's not that long ago. That's 14 days ago. Fauci vaccinated people who contract COVID-19 are far less likely to spread the virus than unvaccinated people. Well, that's a little softening all of a sudden, because remember it was just July 7th and the president's like, it's the unvaccinated or putting these people at risk. And now Fauci's like, well, the vaccinated too, but they're just less likely And, of course, you would think, well, that must be science, right? Spoiler alert. There was zero science behind that at the time. We don't have that science. Fauci was just making another public pronouncement, another public statement. But we didn't have to wait long because that finally turned out and became this. Let's listen in to Fauci on July 27th, just just 10 days after that other statement. Data were clear. Now that we have a Delta variant, That has changed the entire landscape because when you look at the level of virus in the nasopharynx of a vaccinated person who gets a breakthrough infection with Delta, it is exactly the same as the level of virus in a unvaccinated Uh, person. What? Remember, the only way to achieve herd immunity is through a vaccination program. How can a vaccine possibly create herd immunity, which is where you have a firebreak, which is somebody in whom the vex- the virus cannot pass is a vector, comes to that person, hits the firebreak, that person's immunologically competent, the virus stops, gets stopped dead in its tracks, and then the virus can't spread. Fauci just said that we now know, and this is science, that when you swab the nasopharyngeal region of a vaccinated person they have virus loads that are just as high as people who are unvaccinated okay let's carry on he's infected that's the problem so those data are very compelling and that triggered the change in the cdc guideline so now he's trying to explain why the cdc had said oh if you're vaccinated you can take your mask off so we're going to grant you a little freedom back you don't have to wear your mask anymore because you're vaccinated it's kind of like that's your that's your uh that's your prize right that's your that's your prize for being a good player in this sport and now the CDC had to come out and say oh actually maybe you should still wear your mask cuz you're still shedding viruses like crazy out of your out of your uh, nasopharyngeal region at least and so Fauci's now trying to explain why that makes sense if you're following this story right But the bottom line is that we now know that people who are vaccinated are still replicating the virus at loads. And loading is the all important concept at loads that are equivalent to people who are unvaccinated. This whole vaccine story is starting to get just a little bit murky. Let's carry on. Um, So now I guess we I'm just trying to follow the plot. So now we have to say the vaccinated are maybe just as much of a risk as the unvaccinated to communities. I'm going to look forward to the president coming out and um, clarifying that for us. So if you remember, though, the point of the vaccine was so that we could achieve herd immunity so that we could all be collectively safe so that we could all get back to our lives. That was the point that I have. I have hundreds of articles out there saying that the unvaccinated are preventing us from getting back to our normal lives because that was the whole point. But now and this just came out again yesterday. I think the story is going to change one more time. Try and keep up. Here we are uh, with on CNN with Fauci. Matter if people get vaccinated, if everybody is vulnerable to this Delta variant, then why not? Uh, no. Why should people get vaccinated at all? Well, there's a really, really good reason to get vaccinated, Chris, and that is to save your life, to prevent you from being hospitalized, prevent you from dying, because the one thing that is clearly works very well with this vaccine is that even with the Delta variant, it prevents you, if you do get infected, from getting severe disease enough to put you in the hospital. It protects you against infection pretty well, but what it does even better is to prevent you from getting serious disease. So when you get vaccinated, you don't get vaccinated just because you don't want to wear a mask. You get vaccinated because you want to save your life. Your own health is the reason. 
the fact that you want to might now wear a mask because we have a situation where if you do get infected, you might spread it to somebody else. You know, that's almost the secondary issue. The primary issue of getting vaccinated is to save your own life and prevent you from getting serious. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back, back up, Bucky. Let's try else. that again. You know, that's almost the secondary issue. The primary issue. Well, what was that secondary issue? situation where if you do get infected, you might spread it to somebody else. You know, that's almost the secondary issue. The primary. <laughs> okay. I was trying to make sense of all this because that's my job. But um, so now the story is it's actually a secondary issue if you are vaccinated. You get the virus, you replicate it, and you pass it to somebody else. Ah, that's so That's so yesterday. That's secondary. Now Fauci wants you to believe that the primary issue has always been, East Asia has always been at war with West Asia, right? The primary issue has always been that you're going to be safe, uh, safer from, and not, it's not safe, because let's be clear, people who are fully vaccinated are showing up sometimes at a lower rate, absolutely, but still, some of them are getting sick and some of them are getting very sick and some of them are dying still from this disease. So, but that issue there of why people, even though they're vaccinated, are still susceptible is not about the vaccine itself. This isn't a magic bullet. We need a third jab, a fourth, a fifth, a tenth. It's having people who are very sick and very old. They need to be protected. And maybe some of them, if given the right guidance by somebody like Fauci in his bully pulpit, in his strength and power and position there, they actually need to hear that the way that they can protect themselves best is to become healthy, is to clear up some of their underlying metabolic diseases, become less obese, to uh, to begin to uh, have a healthier terrain. That actually would be the number one health policy thing if this was at all about public health. But we're just losing the plot line because the plot line is changing over and over and over again. By the way, that CNN doesn't ask Fauci about his gain-of-function research emails about why he didn't tap any of his own thousands of scientists, why he was calling in virologists with murky pass who the NIH had been funneling money to, who fished it over to Wuhan in order to create things exactly like this virus that we are now combating that has now stolen 18 months of our lives. Why he isn't being grilled on that topic on a daily basis is a very interesting open question. And by the way, Every journalist, including this guy, Chris Como, who is in a position to ask such questions but who doesn't, is just as culpable in my mind as Fauci himself. This is actually not cool. These people are failing at their jobs. They're failing all of us really comprehensively. Um, and so that's my little editorializing about that. So carrying on, um, the reason now that you get vaccinated is to protect yourself. And that's always been the reason, <laughs> according to Fauci. That's... <laughs> We've always, that's what we've always thought. Uh, it's its a very bizarre situation that we find ourselves in. All right. So, um, but then just yesterday, July 29th here, uh, we find out, let's see that, see, look at that, July 29th, Biden unveils his federal worker vaccine requirement, of course, as he adopts tougher approach to get unvaccinated Americans vaccinated. And I pulled this out. This is a CNN article again uh, down here in green. It says, but the goal, according to AIDS, is to render being unvaccinated so burdensome that those who haven't received shots will have little choice other than to get them. That's the goal. Uh, I get that. But before you go ahead and make life, you wield your federal power to make lives so difficult for people that they have to get your shot, I think the first thing you should do is explain why they want to get that shot in a way that's clear and compelling. So we've just found out that actually the reason is, is that they don't want individuals to get sick from coronavirus. That's totally fine. I get it. But if Biden and his administration really cared about saving individuals from individual harm, the first thing we would do is we would outlaw alcohol. And the second thing would be cigarettes. And the third thing would be almost everything from Frito-Lay, right? And the fourth thing would be high fructose corn syrup. In fact, if we really cared about public health, there'd be lots of things we could and we would and we should do if we really cared about that, those sorts of things. So I'm, I've lost the plot because I'm not really clear now why it's such an important mandate to make life so um, burdensome on people who are unvaccinated that it, it's just they have little choice other than to get them. Well, by the way, we've already heard from most people, I think, well, let, let me let me clear this up. 
Because again, about now, I'm going to be getting these angry emails and comments that I'm anti-vax. I'm not anti-vax. I've got plenty of vaccines in me. Just not these at this point in time, because every vaccine, you should be running a nuanced decision-making process because it's a little bit complicated. It's not as easy as yes, no, everybody should, or no, everybody shouldn't. There's a lot of gray territory in there. So let me be totally clear. There's a little, little, I like my little four by four, two by two matrices making a four, a four thing. So uh, should people, is the vaccine indicated? Well, as we've learned, if you, as you go up the y-axis here, you go from zero comorbidities to 10 plus. And along the other axis, our age is going from zero to 100. We would say, if you're over this magic line, let's call this, um, I know it looks halfway, so it should be five, but let's say, you know, you're at that magic six or more comorbidities and you're over a certain age, let's call it 60. The answer is yes, absolutely. The, I think the decision set, even though we know that there's uh, considerable vaccine injuries that are happening to some people, and we'd love to know exactly why that's happening. Listen, it seems pretty clear that this is a, a, an easy yes for people in that quadrant. Let's say you're younger than a certain age. Let's say it's 40, but you still have more than a certain number of comorbidities. The answer would be probably. Again, nuance. It would depend on which comorbidities you have because we found from the CDC eight of them are much worse than the rest of them. So if you had those eight, you probably would want to consider uh, getting a vaccine. Number one on that chart was obesity. Number two, surprisingly, was fear and anxiety-related conditions. Not sure if that was causal or just correlated or caused by COVID to become a, a correlated factor. Uh, hypertension didn't show up on that, but uh, cardiac issues, things like that. So if you were on that, if you, if you have any of these comorbidities over here, uh, down here on this chart, obesity, anxiety, diabetes with complication, chronic kidney disease, all that. Yeah, I would say this is a probably that puts you in a probably, but maybe not a for sure, 100% sure, because why? Well, there could still be other reasons that it wouldn't make sense for you. The CDC itself says if you had a bad adverse event to either shot one or shot two, you shouldn't get further shots. Even if after if you have an anaphylactic reaction, a bad adverse event for your immune response. After shot one, you shouldn't get shot two. Those people, here's some nuance, are going to be unvaccinated. Uh, those people, I don't know what how the Biden plan works for those people. By the way, if you've already had COVID, uh, you have the best immunity. You might say, hmm, I'm going to make a decision. Maybe not in this particular case. Well, what if uh, what if you're above a certain age, but you have like only you have zero or maybe one comorbidity? Well, that's you now you're in definite maybe territory. Really depends, right? Do you work in a job that absolutely requires it? Are you at a high risk for other reasons? Is there some other condition that you have, like you live at home with somebody who definitely has uh, comorbidities and things like that, and you just you want to give yourself a little extra um, uh, protection on that? Although, as we're finding out. Maybe that's no protection at all because maybe you're still shedding it at the same rate as, as fully vaccinated. But there is a whole quadrant down here below a certain age and below a certain level of comorbidities. I put this no way down in this left corner because if you're if you're like under 10 and you're healthy, there's really there's I can't there's no super solid reason here um, that I can find unless we're saying that this Delta variant is with more data. We're going to discover that it leads to long haul situations. It has bad outcomes and that we know that the vaccine protects from those syndromes. We don't have that data yet, right? We just don't. We would have this data if we were running anything like a nuanced, subtle, complicated, wonderful, decent, adult-sized strategy in this country, and we weren't saying dumb stuff like this. Like, it's binary. Everybody needs to be vaccinated or not. Dumb stuff like this, which is unvaccinated Americans, and we don't care how healthy we don't care any condition. We don't care about whether they've had a vaccine, you know, a vaccine, bad reaction in the past. We don't care about any of that. We're just going to say bad and good, this camp and that camp. All right. So at any rate, uh, that's how I would look at it. And so it's complicated and we need nuance, which means we need good data, which means we can't be flip flopping, which means means we need to have a consistent and coherent public strategy that makes sense. And by the way, it can't just be Magic bullet vaccine or nothing. There's a lot of things we should be doing over here as I continually talk about preparing our terrain. There are a variety of treatments out there that actually are really coming along. There's exciting research all the time for how we can actually uh, get at these things. And so that makes the most sense to me. Now, all of this 
you might be surprised to know, reminded me a little bit of this L. Du Huxley quote, which says, to be able to destroy with good conscience, to be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation. This is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. Who was he talking about? I think he was talking about this guy. Hey, James. James wrote, he tweeted, I would like to make sure I'm being clear here. If you're over 50, unvaccinated, you die gasping on an oxygen concentrator, I would like to come visit you in hospital so my vaccinated self can laugh in your loved one's face. Ouch. Uh, Logging off before I say something ugly. Uh, A little late on that one, uh, James. Uh, this not to pick on James. This is a this is a horrifying quote to me, and it's it reminds me of this one, of course. Obviously, it just the parallels like perfect. Um, but there are a lot of people who hold this view, and they got this view because their leaders had been telling them a very consistent story that there's a bad class of people out there who are doing something to everybody. But as we found out, it's actually a more nuanced story than that. This is a story that we could have, should have. And would have resolved if we'd had better leadership than this guy. This guy's horrifyingly bad leadership on this whole thing from start to finish. And uh, we sh- we deserve not to be gaslit about that anymore. Let me put it full stop. This guy, bare minimum, needs to be fired. I think he actually needs to be investigated. And I actually think he ought to be criminally investigated for a variety of actions that he undertook to hide uh, this pandemic from people and to hide the origins of the pandemic and giving out bad advice that was not scientific in nature. You hear me being a little annoyed. It's because I like my science. Science is repeatable and it's free of bias. And this guy injected bias every chance he could. And so I'm really annoyed by that. And I hope that um, uh, he's, he's out of, hope he's out of office soon. And by the way, For those of you who are wondering, yes, I have personally treated just as many COVID patients as this gentleman here. We are equivalent. We have the same level of expertise. All right. So with all of that said, I think I got to get off my high horse here for a second and just say, here are my conclusions. Uh, it's, It's very clear. Look, lack of a clear, reasonable, responsible message is making everything 100 times harder than it needs to be. We need to have that clarity. We need to be absolutely 100% forthright with ourselves. We need to add that nuance back in. We need to talk about it's a complex situation. Let's act like grownups about it, right? Let's create that risk matrix and make sure we all understand it so that that way, that's how we will reach people. If we decide as a society and as scientists that vaccines make the most sense, and by the way, they can and they often do depending on the circumstance, right? Smallpox, absolutely. Polio, you got it. Tetanus, yes. Rabies, I have all of these particular vaccines in me. Um, And I like them. This one's a little bit less clear, and we need to be clear about that and the reason for that. Health authorities, they've lost all my respect. I think somebody needs to stand up a brand new health body at the world level and at the national level here in the United States because the no treatments for you paradigm is absolutely mind-bogglingly bad. It's medical nihilism. And I, everybody who stands for it uh, is just, you're going to wake up one day and, and look back and say, wow, did I, wh- where did I, how many, how did, where did I go wrong in life? Uh, the way, the way out of this, there is a way out, by the way, is to help boost people's actual health, right? And we're going to have to just learn to live with a virus. Our chance of actually defeating this virus, that ship sailed a long time ago. It's now endemic. So it's here and it's time to get on with life. That's what people are saying by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in cities all over the world. They're like, we're tired, we're done. And can we just get back on with life? And the answer is yes. If we were being at all subtle about this, we would say, well, let's protect the the people who really need protecting, who are in that quadrant, that upper quadrant of that, of that chart I put up. Um, but everybody else can pretty much get on with their lives at this point in time is how I see it. Uh, Fauci. Fauci, he really, you know what, he needs to be criminally investigated for his role in helping to create this virus. Um, And so that means full subpoena power. I I don't want anybody to be able to weasel out, take the fifth, any of that stuff. Let's see what's in those emails. Let's uh, let's do the full sweep um, and see what's in there. Because if this virus was actually created, and maybe it isn't, maybe it wasn't, but we need the investigation. If this thing was actually created through our own tax dollars and then covered up by somebody, I think we deserve to know that. Don't you? I certainly do. And by the way, 
my final conclusion, I hadn't watched CNN in a long time till I pulled those clips. I got it's literally no better for me than having an abusive ADHD parent with deep personality issues. It's just like I don't even know how to process what's coming out of CNN anymore. It's 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 a belief propaganda factory. It's not about data. It it changes its opinion without ever letting you know what happened. And by the way, they per, they have CNN's more about opinions and beliefs and it's not about data. It's not about science. And the fact that they don't grill Fauci and they give him a platform to continue to spout things which are nonsense, complete nonsense, um, it's just, it's unfortunate. Personal opinion. There, it's free. You got it. Uh, By the way, this is my personal terrain supplement, and I've added one on here. By the way, not medical advice. I don't give medical advice. I'm just telling you what I do. These are all things that are in my uh, toolkit. And by the way, I have a new thing on there. If you have sharp eyes, you'll notice that little thing called niacin down there. What an incredible story about that. We're going to be talking more about that, especially uh, Dave Fairtex at our website is, is just really uh, turned, turned my, there's a big story here. Can't wait to share it with you. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. So with that, uh, I moved it and it still didn't move it far enough. I'm going to get this right one of these days. Hey, you know what? doesn't have to be this way. It really doesn't. I see people waking up all the time. You can help that process. What's easy? Hey, you're sitting at your computer right now. Do the things over there on the left side. I want you to support us. Please like the video. Just click the like button. Very easy. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've had lots and lots of new subscribers in the past few weeks. It's been great. You can sign up for alerts. Uh, please put your comments down below here. Share with five friends. That's the big thing. If you want to spread the message and you want people to wake up like I do, you got to share this. So it's that easy. It's that hard. Uh, you got to be a leader amongst your friend group and, um, and send out material like this. And, uh, over there down below me, you can see all the ways you could, um, follow us and support our work. So that's all I have for today. Listen, I want you to be happy. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be safe. If you want to hear part two of this, by the way, there's another part. I'm holding it at my website. You can click here. Um, if not, come to peak. If you can't see this for some reason, come over to peakprosperity.com. I'm going to be talking about the economic impacts of these lockdowns that are coming. I'm reading some signs out there that say there's some really big economic uh, gyrations coming. Inflation, things like that. I'm a little bit worried about that. By the way, more people are going to be directly impacted by what's coming economically than anything else that's happened or is about to happen will get hit there first. So that's why I have to talk about it because there's pretty serious stuff going on. All right, that's all I have for you out here today at YouTube. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.